let me uh, explain the LLM first. Um, not the, what it is, but why would a, a guy who believes in American sovereignty get a degree in international law? And the answer is, I was doing opposition research, and I decided to get a degree in it so that uh, I've led the charge for a long time to defeat the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Uh, I was the, uh, one of the two opponents of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, the last two hearings we've had on it. And we, we killed it. I mean, we, uh, there were 300 organizations lined up in favor of these treaties. But I concluded someplace along the way that somebody needed to be schooled in the details so that we could get it, you know, if they wanted to get in the weeds and argue the weeds, we could argue the weeds with them. And, and we, we would best them. Um, the, uh, the reality is, is our State Department, our Senate Foreign Relations Committee leadership, and other people lie about the effect of international law. They say one thing in the United States, they say something quite differently when they get to, um, well, that foreign country called New York City, um, yeah. <laughs> up in the UN, or, or if they go to Geneva or Strasbourg or other places. We tell two different tales on that. And I wanted somebody who would defend the sovereignty of the United States to be able to have the, the background to do that. So that's why, why I, I got that degree in international law. So it was, uh, you know, it was unusual. Um, they didn't really like some of my opinions on some of the tests. So it's kind of, <laughs> kind of funny. Um, but um, I, I agree with 99% uh, of the presentation you got here. I'm, I'm going to, to, to just take a variant on the same theme, though, because there are two constitutions, and the two constitutions you saw here is a valid application of that, that idea. But I'm going to do a slightly different application of it. There, there's the Constitution as written, and then there's the Constitution as interpreted by the Supreme Court. And when we think of the fact that, you know, a lot of people that have their heads halfway screwed on straight and say, well, they don't obey the Constitution at all in this country anymore. Well, it depends on which Constitution you're talking about. If you're talking about the Constitution as written, that's absolutely true. The Washington, D.C. doesn't give you two cents for the Constitution as written. And it really doesn't really matter whether we're talking about the whole, you know, through Amendment 26, or just the original Constitution plus the first 12 amendments. They don't care for anything. And they want to do what they want to do because they've got, a, uh, in their minds, a superior weapon. It's called the Constitution as interpreted by the Supreme Court. Yeah. And they do obey that, at least, you know, mostly obey that. Even, they even get outside that once in a while. But basically, they're in obedience with the Constitution as interpreted by the Supreme Court. Now, there are two ways to interpret the Constitution in big terms. There's, there's a thousand different minor ways, but there are really two big ways to interpret it. One is you take the words as they were originally written and say, what did those words mean to the generation that wrote and ratified those words? The other way to do it is, what do these words mean to us, the judges on the Supreme Court, what we think it should mean? Radically different ideas, radically different concepts. And you know, to illustrate this, I, I recently learned something about Shakespeare that I didn't know, and it really drives home the point. All of you probably remember the famous balcony scene in Romeo and Juliet, where Juliet stands up and says, Wherefore art thou, Romeo? Now, like me, you probably thought all your life that that meant basically, Hey, Romeo, where are you, dude? You know, that's, that's what she, where are you? But wherefore, in Shakespeare's time, meant why? Why? Why did I fall in love with Romeo? Out of all the people I could have, I could have fallen in love with, Juliet was saying, why did I fall in love with the enemy of my family? You know, she's being tortured. She's talking about a completely different idea. She's not saying, Romeo, where are you? And he's down under the balcony listening to her. She was saying, why did I fall in love with, love with the enemy of my family? When you understand the original meaning of wherefore, it completely changes your understanding of that scene. The same thing is true with important provisions in the original Constitution. When you understand the meaning of the word general welfare, and the general welfare clause, what it really meant, it's completely different than what it sounds like to our modern ears and what it sounds like to the Supreme Court of the United States. The same thing is true of the Commerce Clause. We'll, we'll, in fact, we'll start with the Commerce Clause. To us, commerce today means business. That's not what it meant then. It's as different as wherefore in Shakespeare time and wherefore in our time. Commerce in 1787 meant shipping. Yes, that's right. 
Manufacturing was not commerce. Agriculture was not commerce. Banking was not commerce. Uh, mining was not commerce. Business transactions are not commerce. Commerce is shipping. If you tap General Motors plant, there is no commerce going on in the General Motors plant. The accumulation of the raw materials is not commerce. The financial transactions are not commerce. The salaries you pay your workers are not commerce. Commerce starts at the General Motors plant when the cars roll off the assembly line and at the moment they go in those little trucks, you know, they, they come outside, that's where commerce starts. They go off the loading up onto the truck, commerce starts. Now if that truck is just going across a part of the same state, that's intrastate commerce. If that truck is going to cross a state line, that's interstate commerce. If it's, that truck's going to cross uh, over into Canada, that's international commerce. But commerce is shipping. When that truck gets to the car dealership, wherever that car dealership is, and that car is taken off the truck, commerce is over. So nothing that happens in the car dealership, the wages of the people earning at the car dealership are not commerce. The environmental practices of, the, uh, of, of GM, that's not commerce. The only thing that's commerce is the shipping. Now many of you in this room look like you basically more or less my age, especially in a musical sense. You all remember Dionne Warwick, trains and boats and planes. If you think Dionne Warwick, you understand commerce. It's trains and boats and planes. Now we can give them a few other things. You know, the internet really is commerce. It's shipping electrons across state lines. That is commerce. And, you know, the Federal Aviation Administration, air traffic controllers, that's a legitimate modern application of the Commerce Doctrine. Congress does have completely legitimate authority over airplanes flying across state lines. Absolutely legitimate. But regulating hours and wages of babysitters, regulating the environmental the environment, you know, I just I can't stop. When I ever say the word environment, I think of the glancing goose test. The Environmental Agency, uh, Protection Agency made up law, which is a violation of Article 1, Section 1. All legislative authority is vested in the Congress of the United States. And so, anytime any federal regulation is made by any federal agency, it's a violation of Article 1, Section 1. Every single provision of the Code of Federal Regulations, 200 volumes, of, not 200 laws, 200 yes. books yes. of laws, I, I, don't, I don't know, there's thousands of laws. My best estimate, 7,000 or so laws. In there. I don't know, really. But it's thousands. 200 books of laws. One of the environmental protection agency laws is this. We have protected federal wetlands under the guise that these lands are part of the navigable waters of the United States. Now, at Patrick Henry College, we have federally protected wetlands that consists of a creek that's there when it rains real hard. You couldn't float a canoe <laughs> In fact, you couldn't float this cup on that creek 99 days out of 100. One day a year, you could probably float the cup on the creek. But, the, but uh, we didn't define in the law how much land had to be wet in order to be a federally protected wetland. And we didn't define how wet it had to be. And so the EPA made up laws called regulations to define each of those things. So, how much land? It took acre. Could have been 100 acres, could have been 20 acres, could have been 10 square feet. It took a relatively small amount of land. It's an acre is the answer. How wet does it have to be? This is where they go crazy. When a goose is flying over the land at, on the wettest day in 100 years and looks down on the land at that moment, on the wettest day in 100 years, and sees his reflection in the water, then it's wet enough. And it's called the glancing goose test, and I'm not making it up. <laughs> now, if we pass that through Congress rather than through the EPA, guess what would happen? You can just see the ads. Congressman Smith apparently doesn't have the brains God gave a goose. You know, you, 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 you roll this stuff out. Congress loves the Environmental Protection Agency making the laws for them because then there's no political responsibility. You know, they, they come up with some stupid law, and the congressman says, well, I wrote the Environmental Protection 
agency a stern letter. Oh, thanks very much. <laughs> that didn't do you a bit of good. You know, they throw them in the stern letter file, which is round and about this tall. <laughs> and and it, it is absolutely not consistent with the original intent of the Commerce Clause and not cons consistent with Article 1, Section 1. By the way, if you want to know what the most important rule in any organization is this, who has the power to make the rules? Always the most important rule. Whether you're talking about church government, student council, Patrick Kennedy College, the United States, the UN, whatever it is, who has the power to make the rules? Always the most important rule. And what's supposed to be the rule is all legislative authorities vested in the Congress of the United States. All executive orders are unconstitutional, unless they are things like the internal operation of the government. If he wants to issue an order saying what the dress code is at the, at the White House, fine. That's okay. If you want an executive order saying the, United, the Washington Monument will be open from dusk until dawn, fine. You can do that. That's the internal operations of government. But when you start issuing executive orders about private people and private property, and expect them to obey that. That's called law. And all law is supposed to be Article 1, Section 1. Congress of the United States is supposed to do that. And they're not supposed to be able to delegate that authority to anybody. But it is massively disobeyed in our, our country. Commerce needs to be fixed. The General Welfare Clause is similarly uh, problematic. Um, Chief Justice John Roberts gave us a really good example of what's wrong with, with the General Welfare Clause. It is Obamacare decision. By the way, just for the record, I, I, would like, I would like Chief Justice Roberts to retire from the Supreme Court and run for office because I'd like to support him. I'd like to send him a donation of 30 pieces of silver uh, uh, to support his candidates. Uh, and so uh, the, uh, Justice Roberts ruled that there is no constitutional limitation on the power of Congress to tax and spend. None. That's the meaning of the General Welfare Clause today. Zero limitation of the power to tax and spend. The General Welfare Clause, according to James Madison, meant something different than according to Alexander Hamilton. And I'll take either of their, their views. I'd be fine with either one. Madison said it's not a power to tax and spend at all. Well, power to spend on anything other than the other 20 enumerated powers. Hamilton said, no, it's a 21st power. But what it meant was this. The federal government could have spend money on those things that, that are outside the jurisdictional competence of the states and are in the national interest. There's only two things I know of that the federal government has ever spent money on that satisfies Hamilton's test. That wouldn't also be lawful under Hamilton, Madison's view. So there's two differences in all of American history. The Louisiana Purchase, Jefferson, who shared Madison's view, thought it was unconstitutional, it was so important they did it anyway. Well, under Hamilton's view, it was perfectly legitimate. Uh, and the other thing is NASA. So purchase of, like, like, no, it's not just Louisiana purchase, but the Alaska purchase, the Gadsden purchase, those other purchases like that. That would be legitimate under, under um, Hamilton's view of the general welfare clause. Whereas, uh, and, and NASA. Other than that, I can't think of any other thing in American history where there's a difference between the founding fathers. So even where you find a difference of opinion, it's really narrow. And none of them would agree with where we are today that there is no constitutional limitation on the power to tax and spend. I don't want to live in a country where Congress has no constitutional limitation on their power to tax and spend. I mean, there's two problems with it. One is we're spending too much money. I mean, not just a little too much money, just immorally too much money. It is stealing from these kids that we're here. Because we're, we're taxing people that can't vote. No taxation without representation. We're doing it every single day. A third of our budget every year is no taxation without representation. Violates the principle of no taxation without representation. Every single dollar borrowed violates that principle. And, and, and it's because they, they don't think that there's any subject matter limitation on their power to spend. Well, if, the reality is general welfare to our ears sounds pretty broad. And they get away with this nonsense of, well, you can spend for the general welfare. And Obamacare is for the general welfare. And all these other entitlement programs are for the general welfare. You know, 
the words have been transferred as through their meanings today compared to what they were when the country started. And if, you want to, if we want to solve the vast majority of the runaway federal government problems, we fix the general welfare clause, we fix the commerce clause, and we fix the ability uh, of the regulatory agencies to make law. We have fixed 99% of the problems in those three things. The spending goes away, the taxation goes away, the debt goes away, the crushing regulations on our business go away, because what the founders intended was a very simple government. One level and only one level of government is to deal with every issue. The overlapping jurisdiction, called technically concurrent jurisdiction, is extremely limited, and it has to be expressly stated in the Constitution. There's very, you know, the only real clear example is the regulation of alcohol because of the 21st Amendment. That's concurrent jurisdiction, not much else. Roads, there's, this, there's a concurrent jurisdiction because Congress can spend money for postal roads, whatever that is. I, I've never done the original re research on it because we're not limited to postal roads. We're using the general welfare clause to do all this nonsense. It doesn't mean as much as they think it means, but it means something. So there is some overlap in jurisdiction on the roads. Roads and alcohol, that's the only two things in the Constitution where there's concurrent jurisdiction. You know, just think of what businesses would be like if they didn't have two sets of environmental regulations. Mm -hmm. Two sets of labor regulations, two sets of minimum wage regulations, two sets of all these kind of regulations that they have to deal with. Businesses would flourish in this country if we had one set and only one set of regulations in, in, our, in our country. That's the way it should be. And then hopefully, you know, at the state level, states can decide whether they will be freedom states and have very, very limited regulations, or you want to be a, you know, a nanny state, you know, socialist state, and you have a lot. And we'll just see how it works out for you. you know? Freedom is going to flourish. Uh, oppression will not flourish. But when it's done at the national level, we're all not flourishing because of the oppression that's, that's coming from the federal government. There's a fourth fix that really is essential, and that is the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has said 30 times that there is no limitation on the Supreme Court's power other than its own internal sense of self-restraint. I don't want to live in a country where there's no checks and balances on the Supreme Court. I mean, the Supreme Court has said it themselves. There are no checks and balances on us. It doesn't work. The checks and balances the founders intended didn't come into fruition because they had no experience with the Constitutional Court. Why? They had no experience with the Constitution. Our Constitution was the first time in human history that a nation was governed by a written Constitution. And they didn't figure out exactly how it was going to work. They, they said that they thought that the court would be the least dangerous branch of the government. And if they followed the, the Constitution as written, it would be the least dangerous branch of the government. But because they have amassed power to themselves to change the meaning of the Constitution by so-called interpretation, it is an incredibly powerful branch. So, how do we fix all this stuff? The only way you can fix the problems I've outlined is through corrective constitutional provisions. Uh, as was alluded to, stated actually pretty directly by the kids, George Mason, at the end of the Constitutional Convention, said, there's going to be a day when the federal government ex uh, um, exceeds its authority. And when that day happens, we're going to need amendments to rein, rein them in. And the kinds of amendments that we're going to need will never come from that source and by in context, it's very clear it means Congress. Congress will never propose amendments that rein in the power of the federal government. So he said, we've got to give the states the ability to rein in the federal government in allow them. And that's why we have Article 5 in the Constitution, to give the states the unilateral ability to rein in the federal government. Mm -hmm. So, you know, with what I've just told you, I, mean, I, can, I have written, frankly, proposed amendments that fix all those problems. And I'll, I'll tell you about some of it in just a minute. But why haven't we done this already? The reason we haven't done this is because of a combination of fear and lies. Now, let's talk about the lies first. The lies are told originally by leftists, originally by people who hated the Constitution. But they've been picked up by some of our friends, people who really do love the Constitution. But sometimes your friends show intellectual schizophrenia. And this is, on, this is one of those occasions. 
They go around. How many of you have heard that the original Constitution was an illegally adopted uh, document by the result of a runaway convention? Anything like that? Yeah. yeah, many of you have. It's a lie. It's a lie of, uh, uh, of people who hate the Constitution, picked up and repeated by people who actually love the Constitution. Here's why it's a lie. The lie is premised on a document passed by Congress under the Articles of Confederation on February 27th, excuse me, February 21st, 1787. That document doesn't say what they think it says, and it doesn't mean at all what they think it means. But you, to understand the, 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 um, the context, thank you very much. I tend to wander and sit. And, yeah, that's great, thank you. Um, the, you have to understand where did the Constitution come from? Who called the convention? Who gave the delegates their authority? What authority did they have? That's the issue at hand. Virginia called the Constitutional Convention. Not Congress. Months before February 21, 1787, Virginia was the first state to call for the Constitutional Convention. They packed, the General Assembly passed the resolution. They named their delegates by name. They gave them credentials like you give diplomats. Uh, credentials. They weren't working under the Articles of Confederation. There's no provision in the Articles of Confederation to do this. Why did they do it? Because the states had residual sovereignty and they were using the residual sovereignty of the state to act. But for it to be effective, they had to get all the states to come with them. And so they set out the process to see if they could get the other states to come with them. And the instructions they gave to the delegates were this. To render the federal constitution adequate for the exigencies of the union. That's it. Those were the instructions. Seven other states. Now, New Jersey, later the same day, passed the same thing as Virginia. The, the wording was almost identical. They were working together on the deal because they had met at the Annapolis Convention and openly and above board and told everybody out loud what they were doing. They said, we're going to go try to work this plan. And so the first official act was from Virginia, virtually simultaneously New Jersey, and five other states, a total of seven, acted to call the Constitutional Convention, and all of them named their delegates, gave them instructions, and said to render the federal Constitution adequate for the existences of the Union. Then Congress, on February 21st, 1787, Congress didn't have any authority under the Articles of Confederation to do anything here, nor did they purport to. Congress said, Congress is of the opinion that it's expedient that a convention be held on the time and place already made by the states. And Congress said two things. They said they wanted to render the federal constitution adequate for the existence of the Union, but they also said solely for the purpose of amending and altering the Articles of Confederation. Well, it's the solely for amending part that gets people's nose out of joint. But that didn't come from the states. That came from Congress's endorsement letter. It'd be like, you know, somebody running for office today and somebody who wrote an endorsement letter said something else. Well, the endorsement letter is not the view of the candidate. The endorsement letter of Congress is not the instructions given to the state. It has no bearing. It's a historical interesting point, but it doesn't give the states their instructions. Now, after Congress endorsed it, five more states passed similar uh, provisions. Three states copied the first seven, and two copied Congress. So we have two states, Massachusetts and New York, and you know it, uh, <laughs> where the two copied Congress. They said, they said rendered the Constitution adequate for the existence of the Union, and only amend the Articles, and alter the Articles. They said all those things. It's kind of confusing. And if you want to know why the founders thought that those two states were acting within their authority, you can read Federalist 40 from James Madison. He takes it through meticulously and explains to you in Federalist 40 why those states, those two states, did what they were supposed to do. But ten states were clearly in the right. And what we can know by just knowing how to count is two states can't dictate the agenda to the rest of them. Ten states said it exactly the same as Virginia. Two states said it like Congress. And Madison gives us the reason, because the, frankly the thing is, if you're going to amend or alter something, you can amend it a little or a lot. And it doesn't make any difference. If you have the power to amend it, you can amend it entirely 
including change the title. But in the same document that says only amend, it says render the federal constitution adequate for the existencies of the union. So they're not wandering very far from even that very narrow view of it when they call it the constitution. So, so it's defamation against the constitution to say that those delegates violated their instructions. It's just not true. On the other side, people say, well, yeah, but they changed the rules of ratification. It's supposed to be under the Articles of Confederation uh, Congress in all 13 states. Well, that's because people don't know what they're talking about. Anymore. By the way, for the longest time, I thought the old lies were true. I got my history from the Common Core like everybody else. <laughs> and so, if you get your Common Core history, your public school history, you're, you're going to be told all this stuff. And for, it, it, I learned most of the, the right answer about 10 years ago. And I learned the rest of the right answer in the last two years. So you're all excused if you believe the lie, because I believe the lie a long time myself. But once I actually went and carefully read all the documents, I didn't believe the lie anymore. I believe the truth. So the, the 13 state part, the ratification, they weren't acting under the Articles of Confederation. Remember that. They were acting under residual sovereignty. But if you read those state documents where they appointed their delegates, 10 of the, thir of the 12 told them to send it to Congress and then get all the states to approve it. So they adopted the exact same numerical count, but just it's a different source of law. You know, there's probably not a lot of difference in there, but you just need to know where's the correct source of law here. The states adopted the same approach. And, and the two states that said nothing, the clear implication was they wanted that too. Because when we're acting as sovereign entities, there's only one way. This is a treaty. This is treaty law. This is international law. You've got sovereign states coming together and negotiating a treaty, and the only way you change a treaty is with unanimous consent. It's just, it's been a rule forever. That's the only way you do it. So that's what they would do. So, yes, they needed Congress's approval, and yes, they needed all 13 states to agree, but not because it was in the Articles of Confederation, because that's the nature of how sovereigns deal with sovereigns. And it was in the state's regulations. So, same count, different reason. So, well, what about the count? Congress approved two things. Approved the Constitution. Approved the new process. The new, the, because the Constitutional Convention recommended the new process. Why? Because they wanted the, the, uh, the Constitution to come from the people. We the people. And in order for them to to legitimately say it came from the people, they wanted specially elected delegates from the people to ratify the Constitution. So they recommended a new process. And they were having a problem with my fellow Baptists in Rhode Island. They're not Baptists anymore, they're not that, that much, but you know, I'm an ordained Baptist pastor, so I can make Baptist jokes. If you're, if you're a Baptist, you can join me making Baptist jokes. You know how many Baptists does he take to change the light bulb? This was 12, it takes one to actually change the bulb, and the other 11 to brag on how the old bulb was better than the new bulb. And so, um, yeah, there you go. So, the, um, but they were tired of Rhode Island being the stick in the mud for everything, so they said, we want the people to do it, and we want to be able to go forward if we don't have unanimous consent. But they had to get unanimous consent to change the rules, and they got it. Because all 13 state legislatures, all 13 state legislatures approve the new process by calling conventions. 11 states called conventions, their legislatures called the conventions, the people elected the delegates, the delegates approved the Constitution. Two states did all of it except for that, that last step. Rhode Island and North Carolina, their legislatures called the conventions, thereby approving the new process. They elected delegates in North Carolina. In Rhode Island, they made every voter a delegate. So when they said, we the people, they meant it literally. Uh, they had basically Baptist congregational meetings. Very Baptist meetings. Uh, and so they, um, and, and so those, the North Carolina convention and the uh, Rhode Island conventions both rejected the Constitution initially. Rhode Island eventually ratified when the Bill of Rights were proposed. Rhode Island uh, ratified after the Bill of Rights were ratified. And so they both came in, but later. But, but the crucial time of the unanimous consent is when the, all 13 states approved the new process. And when all 13 approved the new process, 
then the new process is perfectly legal. So when people say today, well, they can just change the process that I did last time. Well, yeah. If you do it lawfully, you can change the process. How would you change the process? How would we change the rules for ratification under Article 5? Here's how you do it. 34 state legislatures would call, have to call for an Article 5 convention for the purposes of changing the rules of ratification. I can't imagine one state legislature doing that, but if you could get 34 state legislatures to call a convention for that purpose, it would be lawful to do. Then you would have to write the amendment and get 26 states to approve at the convention, vote in one state, one vote, the new text for the for the amending process, and then you have to send it back to all the states, and 38 state legislatures have to approve the new process. If you do that, then and only then could you change the ratification process. The idea that it can be just changed willy-nilly is absolute propaganda and balderdash. It's not true. It wasn't true in 1787, in 1789. It's not true today. You cannot change the amending process. We didn't change it then, we can't change it today. We're under Article 5, we're going to follow Article 5. Article 5 has three steps. I like to think of it as locker combinations. If your mind goes elsewhere, you're responsible for your mind, not me. It's 34, 26, 38. Um, and so, uh, 34 state legislatures have to vote on an application to set the agenda for the convention. There have been 400 applications in the history of the Republic. 300, more or less, probably are still valid. Some of them, some states have rescinded the applications, so those aren't valid. And then some, Virginia's application, the very first one, that named the process the Convention of the States in 1788, filed in 1789. Congress wasn't open yet. They passed it in November of 88, sent it off to Congress, and filed it in 1789. One of the Bill of Rights. Well, we got the Bill of Rights. So, that's no longer a valid application. So, um, but about 300 of them are still valid. There was one from Florida back in the 50s where they wanted a world government. Well, that didn't get very far. Um, of course, I did, would note that the Democrats controlled Florida back then. Um, and they also did it in North Carolina. The Democrats controlled North Carolina. Then. Those states, thankfully, think a lot differently today. Um, but um, the... Uh, when there's 34 states that agree on the topic, then and only then you have a convention. You've got to have an agreement on the topic. The convention that, that I am helping to lead the charge for has this as the topic. To impose fiscal restraints on the federal government, limit the power and jurisdiction of the federal government, and impose term limits on federal officials. That's it. It has to be on those topics, and only those topics. And so, so that's 34, 26, 38. 34 states have to approve that language, an application that says we want a convention for that purpose. Then 26 states would have to write the amendments. And I'll tell you about some of the amendments that I'd like to see in a minute. And then 38 states will have to ratify. So the idea that anything crazy could get through this process, you have to just take leave of your common senses. And, you know, this is, I'm, I'm going to say two things. One, is the only way this is going to pass is if there's a grassroots army demanding that it be done. And the best defense that we've got is that same grassroots army. Because if we have enough grassroots people, because the only people that vote, that it matter in all this, are state legislatures. That's it. Governors don't count. President doesn't count. Congress doesn't count. Supreme Court doesn't count. None of them have a vote. None of them have a say. Congress has two ministerial duties that are non-discretionary in nature and cannot change. You know, they got to tell you the date and the city where the convention is going to start, and they got to say it's going to be ratified by the by the people through uh, ratification conventions or by state legislatures. I'm good with either way. Frankly, the people are more conservative than the state legislatures. Think of California. California, on the day Obama was elected, voted to preserve traditional marriage. People overwhelmingly voted for it the same day, which, by the way, tells you something politically. If you give the people crisp, clear choices, they'll vote for the right, the right thing. When you give them the choice between uh, uh, you know, leather Democrats and Naga High Democrats, or you know, Democrats and Democrats light, Bud, Bud light, you know, when you give them rhinos 
instead of constitutional conservatives. They're going to vote for the rhinos, but they're for the for the real thing every time. People don't like phonies, and so so you, you give them you know Obama and McCain. You know, the real the real thing's going to win. You give them Mitt Romney and McCain. The real thing's going to win. You give them marriage on the same day that Obama joined. Marriage wins, even in California. Keep that in mind. People trust me. The candidates. Different story. So we cannot worry about those things. When you think of all those roadblocks, because all it takes to stop them is one house in 13 states. But let's say, let's just suspend common sense for a second and imagine that somehow through that whole process that I just articulated for you, we get a repeal of the Second Amendment that's going out to the states to be lower. Well, first thing that would happen is I would sue them. I've sued them before when they tried to change the ratification process in the, for the Equal Rights Amendment. I represented four Washington state legislators when I was a very young lawyer. And uh, uh, I was too young to be doing it. But frankly, there was nobody of my of my parents' generation with the courage to go challenge it. So I did it. And, uh, the, uh, and we won that case. I, my, my case was the first one. The second case was filed by people representing Idaho and Arizona legislators. We consolidated our cases, and we won that case. Because the rule of law was, once you start the process, you can't change the rules in the middle of the street. Seven years was the ratification process. You can't make it ten and a half in the middle of the street. And so, um, you know, been there, done that, litigated it, won. So the, the, uh, the process cannot be changed. If they change the process, I'll sue them. But the ultimate answer is 12 states plus one say no, it's over. And if we can't win those kind of votes, the country's <coughs> dead. You know, we have to just think of all the bad stuff and crazy stuff. We have to suspend common sense to get there. So you're going to be afraid of that? Let me tell you something you should be afraid national debt that they say is $17 trillion. That's, right. That's because they do phony accounting. That's right. right. If you buy a car and you, um, you know, let's say it's a $40,000 car and you get 100% financing, you drive off the lot, how much do you owe? $40,000. How much does the federal government say you owe? Zero. When the first payment comes due of $500, they'll acknowledge they owe $500. That's all. They acknowledge the payments that are due today. Nothing more. Yeah. Now, I'm 62 years old and eligible for Social Security. Wait a second. I said, I'm 62 years old, and you guys are supposed to go, ah, it's not possible. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 62 years old and eligible for Social Security. <laughs> <laughs> it's not as good as if you had done it alone, but I'll take it. <laughs> I paid in a ton of money. No way! Who <laughs> <laughs> said that? I'm going to give you a high <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> I wish I had to pay you a whole bunch of money, but I had. How much do you, you know, an actuary can figure out how much the Social Security Administration owes me? It's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. How much do they carry in the books? Zero. Zero. The real national debt is north of 100 trillion. Yeah. It's probably closer to 200 trillion. Mm -hmm. and, and so I, I, I went and visited Jim Miller, talked to him about this. Jim Miller was Ronald Reagan's director of OMB. And he said, those numbers are right. You don't know exactly how much it is because they're funny accounting. But it is a big number. It's a big number. The NSA is spying on us. The president says, I can change the law, it might win. The attorney general says, I don't have to enforce the law of the United States. The Supreme Court says there's no checks and balances on our power. There is no power against the, limiting the government's power to tax and spend. We can order the states what to do through federal strings of manipulation, which is another problem with general welfare laws. Which one are you afraid of? The Article 5 process? with all the checks and balances in place, 
or this freight train that is on the track, it's got full fuel in its engine, and it is running down the track at us at 100 miles an hour right now. Which one are you afraid of? There's one that's real, there's one that is imagined. There's one that's absolutely real and staring us in the face, and it's going to destroy this country. And, you know, so, which one are you afraid of? I'm afraid of the real thing. I'm not afraid of imaginary shadows and ideas that basically make me have to distrust the American people. Now, I don't trust state legislators that much either. I don't trust, frankly, I don't trust anybody that much. Because, why? Because every man's born with sin nature. And we just have to make, we have, we have rules in this country designed to do a workaround with sin nature. And we want to keep power at the lowest possible level. And the day we think we can trust government, we fail. So when I say I trust state legislators more than I trust Congress, that doesn't mean I trust them, because you got to keep watching. But I do. I trust state legislators more than I trust Congress, especially on the issue of how much power should Congress have. Now, if the issue was on how much power should the state legislators have, well, that'd be different. Then I'm going to trust the voters more than I trust, you know. But if, if, if on the issue of how much power Congress should have, I guarantee you I trust state legislators more than I trust Congress. How much power should the Supreme Court have? I trust state legislators more than I trust the Supreme Court. How much power should the President have to make law? I trust state legislators more than I trust the Supreme Court. One of the reasons I can trust state legislators more is because we can keep an eye on the law. There's fewer of them. I mean, there, there, there's fewer people that they have that they can fool. You know, there's a few thousand versus, versus hundreds of thousands. And a few thousand people can bear down on a state legislator and can get them to do the right thing. It's easier to throw them out of office than it is Congress. It's easier to throw them out of office than it is the Environmental Protection Agency, I guarantee you. And so we have to make a decision. Where does our strength lie? Our strength lies at the states. Now, some people are talking ideas like nullification. If, if nullification means we don't take the money for Common Core, and we tell them to, you know, to go pound sand, we're not going to take your money, we're not going to take your strings, we're not going to do Common Core in Virginia, if that's what you want to call nullification, I'm all for it. But if you're talking about one state nullifying a federal law by just simply saying so, it, it, it's somebody's pipe dream. They've been, they've been hanging out in Colorado for a little too long. <laughs> Catch my marijuana laced drip. Uh, let's take Obamacare. O Oklahoma only had one legislator introduced a bill to nullify Obamacare. The idea was if you if you refused to participate in Obamacare and you got fined, the state was going to give you your money back. So I said to them, Well, you mean you're going to have one taxpayer give another taxpayer his money back? Because he didn't do a long care. He says, no, no, we're going to take it from the federal government. I said, well, where are you going to get the money from? He said, well, we're supposed to pay excise taxes, like for gas and stuff. And we'll just take it out of that and give it to them. I said, okay, well, good. The federal government won't care if you give the people the money from them. They'll, by the way, they'll charge them income tax for that. But, but they, they won't, you know, they'll let you do it because they just get a cycle of money and <coughs> your tax liabilities go up and down. But they'll let you do that part. But you take their excise tax money, federal court is going to rule that illegal. And if you don't trump them on voluntarily, they'll just issue a levy against the, the bank accounts of the state of Oklahoma. They'll, they'll take the money from you. Then what are you going to do? They don't have an answer. Because there is no answer. The only thing you can do is pick up your guns and shoot them. And unless we're actually going to be involved in an armed insurrection, there is no ability to nullify the things that really matter. There's no ability to nullify going to war without a declaration of war like the Constitution says. There's no ability to nullify the national debt. There's no ability to nullify the NSA spying on us all. There's no ability to nullify the Environmental Protection Agency. There's no ability to nullify the things that really matter. It just doesn't work. I wish it would work. Well, sort of. I wish. Let's take an example. Hobby Lobby is before the Supreme Court right now. The Congress didn't say you had to furnish abortions. The Secretary of Health and Human Services said you had to furnish abortions. So we've got an Article 1, Section 1 violation right there. Congress didn't make the law. It's just an Obama law. So, um, but there's a federal law called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. I'm the guy who named it. I was the chairman of the group of lawyers who wrote it. 
We were trying to fix a Supreme Court decision with the free Supreme Court through the First Amendment to the trash can. And so, um, and it passed. 98 to the Senate, unanimously in the House. I went to the coalition meetings to draft it. It was a bunch of lefties and me, a bunch, you know. It looked like the original Star Wars bar scene. It was, it was an amazing thing. But here's what happened. The Jewish community correctly understood religious freedom. They wanted the free exercise of religion. We don't agree on prayer in school and all things like that. But we agree on private people and private organizations and private religious organizations having the freedom from government intrusion. We agree on the free exercise part of things. And the Jewish organizations told, told the ACLU and people for the American Way and people like that, you will get on board. And they did. They called in all their political capital, and those lefty groups got on board because the Jewish community did the right thing and demanded their, their political allegiance. And so we had the most interesting coalition in the history of politics. And it passed unanimously in the House, 98 to 2 in the Senate. The Religious Freedom Restoration Act has used, been used successfully in the lower courts by Hobby Lobby to say it violates our religious freedom to have to pay for abortions. Now, if you can nullify that, California would nullify the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. If one state can nullify, you know, if a conservative state can nullify, a liberal state can nullify too. So California can say, yeah, 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 I know the Religious Freedom Restoration Act on the books, Hobby Lobby, and I know the Supreme Court said that that's valid and applies to you. We have, I hope that's going to be the outcome. The, uh, I believe it will be if they go read the trans, uh, tr the records of Congress. I said myself in the hearings that my parents' bookstore, which is a corporation, was entitled, which is a Christian bookstore, was entitled to religious freedom protection against government intrusions in, in those things. So there's a legislative history on a very important question. But, so I believe they're going to win. But when they do win, and California says we nullify that, you got to pay for abortions in our state? Well, if you like nullification, that's what you get. I don't want California to be able to do that. And I want California and Massachusetts to nullify. If, if our country declares war, I don't want California and Massachusetts to say, no, we don't declare war. We're going to nullify the declaration of war. You know, if, if we're going to stand as a nation, we've got to stand as a nation. And we nullify things as states with an S, not as a state. And we nullify things as states in Article 5. James Madison, 1833, in a letter to one of his friends said, the ultimate form of nullification is Article 5, and the states, plural, have the power to nullify federal law. You want to, I don't want to nullify Obamacare. I want to nullify the power of Congress to tax and spend for medical purposes. Mm. No, because if you take out you know, re, uh, you know, repeal and replace, no. Repeal and destroy their power to ever do this to us again. Yes. Yes. You know. yes. I want to take away the power of the federal government to ever tell the states what they can do with education ever again, ever for anything, period. That's, that's the correct approach. That's the constitutional approach. And the only way we do this is through Article 5. We can do it. There are 4,000 House districts in 40 states. There are 10 states, I'm not really counting. California, Massachusetts, New York, Illinois. Although Illinois is for sale, so. <laughs> uh, but we aren't into grafting corruption, so. Um, I'm not worried about 10 states. 40 state strategy, because I ultimately need 38 states to wrap it up. In those 40 states, there are 4,000 state house districts. 4,000 state house districts. Um, if you organize house districts, by definition, you organize Senate districts. My goal is to organize 75% of those districts with a minimum of 100 people in each district. Now, I've kind of modified that from my original thing. If it's a, an easy state, a state like Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi, 50 to 100 would be plenty. Because the legislators there are going to do the right thing. If it's a state, a purple state like Virginia, you're going to need more than 100. We might need as many as 1,000. But if you have 1,000 people call a state legislator and ask them to tr climb a tree and sing, I want to hold your hand in French, they'll do it. Almost all the time. 
<laughs> I don't need all the time. I need 50% plus one vote to be able to, to do this. And by the way, folks, I'm not doing it just so we pass these amendments. I'm doing it just so the states will have good government afterwards. Okay. And once you create these mechanisms, and these grassroots teams with people on the ground paying attention to what's going on, and you perpetuate that time and time again, and you pay attention to what the state legislature is doing over and over again, then we have the machine in place to preserve freedom. The, the guy at the Virginia Convention, George Nichols, who was by the militia, uh, the Virginia military leader, that shot the first bullets at the Redcoats when they dared to invade the Commonwealth of Virginia, spoke on the floor of the the Virginia Ratification Convention, on the first full day of the convention, they had some problems getting a quorum, but on the first full day of the convention, Nicholas stood up and answered Patrick Henry. Now, I, frankly, I'm really glad that Madison pushed the Constitution, but I'm also glad that Patrick Henry opposed the Constitution, because, because of Patrick Henry's opposition, because there was no Bill of Rights without the Bill of Rights. Mm -hmm. So the genius was in the mm -hmm. two of them together. Mm -hmm. and, and so, great solution from those two great men, even though the first season they were opposed to each other. But on the first day, George Nicholas stood up to answer Patrick Henry, because Henry's arguments been out in the press. It wasn't that he made the, the thing on the streets. Out in the press, and he said, um, an enlightened people will never suffer that which is intended for their liberty to become an instrument of tyranny. Meaning, People who pay attention to what's going on will do something about it, enlightened people. We'll never suffer, we'll never allow that which is intended for their liberty, the Constitution, to become an instrument of tyranny. Folks, the Constitution has become an instrument of tyranny in the Supreme Court's hands, in Washington, D.C.'s hands. And the reason is we haven't been an enlightened people. Yeah. I'm tired of not being an enlightened people. Yeah. We need to understand the Constitution, we need to understand what's right, we need to understand the principles of the government. What's the purpose of government? You ever want to ask a candidate one question? No one one question. Say, what's the purpose of government? You know, if they're running for state, what's the purpose of the government of Virginia? What? And if, if they say anything that sounds like to provide for the needs of the people, they're socialists. If they say anything like to protect the life, liberty, and property of the people, and to punish those who do evil, then they believe in the principles of liberty. That's it. You gotta know the purpose of government. And you need people to know the purpose of government to do that. We're creating not only the team to amend the Constitution, to take away the power from Washington, D.C., we're creating the team that's going to be the permanent team of enlightened citizens. They're gonna keep this country on the freedom path. And if California wants to go to join the socialist way, fine, they're not gonna ruin anybody by, the, by themselves. And if we have clear thinking people in Virginia, We'll start electing people like we've elected here. Because we need an enlightened people in Virginia to understand what's going on as well. So, I'm gonna, I know I talked too long, but I'm going to answer any questions that anybody have for just a few minutes, and then we'll go do something else.